Why do we see geometric patterns in psychedelic states? This is episode two of the Psychedelic Map Theory, and here we'll see how common human psychedelic experiences can map out some of the inner workings of our own brain. Obviously, this is speculation. I'm going to phrase it as though it's fact, because that's an easy way of speaking, but you understand, it's just a hypothesis. In episode one, we looked at how psychedelic chemistry may be seeking to take animals out of pursuit mode, which leans into the default mode network in the brain, and move them instead into stay here and engage mode, which uses more cross-brain connections that pertain to instinct. Plants and fungi use the surfaces of animals, so they need to have ways of stopping and starting us, and psychedelic chemistry is one of those ways that seeks to arrest us make us a lot less interested in what we were doing and a lot more content to stay where we are and do nothing. Now, animal responses to these chemicals vary. If it's safe or beneficial to stay where an organism with this chemical pops up, a species will evolve to give in to that signal. If it isn't safe, then a species will evolve to throw up that organism or block it in some way. But the purposes of the chemistry do seem to be to try to stop ambulatory creatures where they are. And what's common to all geometric patterns, which humans perceive to be beautiful, is that they employ two special properties which work together using physics instead of chemistry to achieve the same switching action in the brain. So what they affect is like mechanical serotonin or mechanical psilocybin. Now psychedelic patterns are the result of chemistry, so they're not affecting that switch on their own. But even if the patterns are presented to us in sober states, you can see they have this ability to distract us from what we were thinking and make us stay still and stare at them. And if you look at religious artistry that seems to be based on altered states, These manage to draw people in from around the world. These make people get on a plane with the simple aim of visiting and standing and staring at them in person. And as we'll discover, the fact that the physics of these geometric patterns switches us from pursuit mode to stay here and engage mode, the way psilocybin seems to, is what creates this pleasant sensation within us that we know as the experience of beauty. Now this switch can be triggered by other archetypal instincts, of course, because we've evolved to be arrested by certain things that will benefit us. So when we see a beautiful person or our favorite food, we'll want to stop what we were doing and possibly engage. But what's interesting about patterns is they don't seem to pertain to any archetypal instincts. And that's just another hint that the way they're making us stop where we are is somehow mechanical. So I'll tell you what these two properties are, and then I hope that you'll stay to the end of this video because the properties themselves are deceptively simple, but once you understand how they work to unravel conceptual thought, which I'll explain in greater and greater detail, you also understand how music works and how meditation works and why people enjoy dancing and why if you're stressed out, you could do worse than rocking back and forth. This answers why uh, makeup and jewelry make us more beautiful, even when they're not imitating qualities that we've evolved to find attractive, even when all they're doing is adding layers of arbitrary symmetrical detail. If you understand this mechanism, you understand all of that stuff. So the first property an abstract stimulus has to have to reduce default mode network calculation is it has to be interesting enough to keep us focused on it and stop us from ruminating. However, the second property the stimulus has to have is that despite being interesting, it has to somehow contain hardly any relationships. So it has to be incredibly engaging and yet incredibly simple at the same time. And the result is what you see with patterns that achieve this is they contain enough detail to masquerade as something that's more complicated than it actually is. 
And then once you start looking at it, it, it dawns on you as you inspect it more and more. This is just made up of very few things repeated over and over again. And what patterns that are both interesting and simple do is they effectively clamp our brain in place. And then because it's being prevented from thinking its own thoughts and then being presented with hardly anything to calculate in front of it, the brain is being dialed down through physical entrainment into calculating very little indeed. And when the default mode network is dialed down like this, the stay here and engage network that registers to us through feelings of pleasant connectedness gets dialed up. And I've explained why these two circuits seem to work in inverse proportion in the previous episode. So I'm going to call this the clamp and funnel technique, if you will. I'm sure many of you won't, but you should, because that's what it's doing. It's clamping the brain in place so it can't think about other stuff, then funneling it down into calculating hardly any relationships whatsoever. And this is the same principle employed by flowers, because a flower is interesting enough to catch the eye. It uses colors that its animal partners have evolved to find attractive. It's also intricate enough to masquerade as something more more complex because it takes a bit of processing to behold. But despite being intricate and engaging, it contains such a high degree of repetition. There's repetition of shape, repetition of color, repetition of angle. And so as your eye moves around and around thinking, this looks like there should be a certain amount of relationships here, it finds actually th there's a howl round of similarity as well as repetition there's also often a high degree of patterned relationship within flowers. So you might see the same shape uh, repeated over and over again in iterations that decrease in size. And if relationships in a stimulus are predictably related, that also makes it easier for the brain to calculate what it's looking at and reduces that amount of calculation. This is kind of um, something we exploit when compressing files. You know, we use fractal geometry sometimes to achieve that. So when you consider that this is what an ordinary panorama looks like and virtually nothing here is related to anything around it, you know, each rock really has to be calculated individually, each branch, each movement on the water. There's no symmetry. You can't infer this from this. That's incredibly uh, annoying to have to process. And you can see, therefore, why a geometric pattern, even when it looks complicated, is a very simplified stimulus for the brain to be processing. A flower will also draw you in close to it with its alluring scent, because it's trying to take up as much of your visual field as it possibly can, so you can't even calculate stuff around the edges. Or if you're an insect with a much simpler brain and you're flying inside it, the switching action must be positively overwhelming. A bit like the geometric portals that plants and fungi switch on in the minds of larger animals like us. It's a related technique, as far as I'm concerned, to, to the one that plants employ with their flowers. The aim is to arrest. And what's more effective at clamping and funneling a mammal's brain or an insect brain um, than a flower, which is static geometry, Moving geometry is more effective. It's refreshing your engagement with it with each passing moment. And interestingly enough, um, a very common experience on DMT is that you do go through this portal, the other side of which your perception is totally different, almost like you've been cranked into another state of operation. Obviously, we're law-abiding citizens, DMT, psilocybin, and so on, are illegal in the UK, but I'm talking about this as a phenomenon. Here's a stimulus that's only got one of the properties. It can funnel the brain because it's got very few relationships within it. But what it can't do very well is the clamp part of the equation. It's just not interesting enough. It's not beautiful. It's quite pleasing to the eye, but there's no guile to it. There's no trick to decode in what we're looking at. Whereas if you look at something like this, you, I don't know what I'm looking at. I've got to work it out. You know, this is the same as this. I'm pretty confident all these are uniform, but I almost can't compute what I'm seeing all in one. I have to keep going around and checking everything. And as long as I'm engaged to this extent, I'm being prevented from thinking my own thoughts about the past and future. Now, we know from brain scans that daydreaming involves high default mode network activity. 
So if you focus on anything externally, it reduces DMN activity. That's kind of how mindfulness meditation works. And this is what makes the clamp part of the clamp and funnel technique get off to a good start in cutting down a lot of DMN activity, even before it's funneled down further. Why does daydreaming lean into the DMN so much? Well, rumination involves thinking about complex narratives from the past, present and future. Whereas dealing with something physical means the calculations you're making are more confined to the present moment, the immediate past and the immediate future. So you've been drawn in an awful lot in what you're calculating. There's also the fact that dealing with the external world does use some cross-brain engagement circuitry. Uh, because where the DMN is for rational thought, the more cross-brain connections seem to help with instinctive relation. And we uh, use a lot of our instincts around the laws of physics and so on when we engage with externalities. It's also interesting to understand just what rational thought is made up of. Essentially, it's made of ratios. That's why it's called rational. The scaffolding of conceptual thought is just relational distances across space and relational distances across time. These are the metrics from which concepts are constructed. And in animals, they use rational thought for everything that can't be programmed into their DNA ahead of time. So, you know, it'll be stuff they have to process on the fly. So they'll use this style of thinking for chasing prey, you know, calculating all those distances and running from predators. They'll use it for object permanence, remembering where things are, for facial recognition, for navigation and so on. For humans, it's different. We use conceptual thought for so much more than that because our instincts don't provide us with a comprehensive description of our environment to the extent that the instincts of animals do for them. And so we construct an awful lot of meaning out of conceptual thinking. But the binary code of even complex conceptual thinking is still relational distances across space and across time. And then we tack on our emotional and physiological responses to those concepts based on empirical experience. So if an external stimulus can reduce the amount of relationships your brain is engaging in, that stimulus is cranking down its very capacity to think about concepts at all. And here you might have realized why the clamp and funnel technique is what makes mantra meditation work. Through mantra meditation, you can completely lose your sense of self altogether. And the clamping in mantra meditation comes from the engagement necessary to repeat a mantra physically. It really impedes your ability to daydream if you're having to do something physically, or even if you're repeating it mentally, that still takes some processing power. And then the funneling aspect comes from the high degree of repetition that funnels the brain down into thinking hardly anything at all. You know, you're just hearing the same sounds over and over again, and they've been shorn of conceptual content through repetition. Similarly, music employs this process because what makes a note sound like a note is that it's comprised of many successive waveforms that are all the same shape. I mean, really, the aesthetic sound of a note is almost like an error message in the brain saying, oh yeah, what's this? You know, this is not normal. This is not like a stone falling against stone. Something sentient is probably causing all these uniform waveforms to appear. So what is it? So music uh, that uses notes is basically the same technology as mantra meditation, but at a much higher resolution. Ordinary sound is made of much less patterned waveforms, and therefore each waveform has to be individually processed from scratch. You can't necessarily infer anything about it from its predecessor. So because a note is very simple, it has that funneling capacity on its own. And because sound is about foreground and background, a note blocks out background noise, so you can't calculate round the edges of it. But to make music engaging, to give it that capacity to clamp, as well as funnel, it needs to be patterned. So just as flowers employ related and repeated shapes and colours and angles, to kind of masquerade as objects that are more complicated than they are, Music has to pretend it's an ordinary sound as well, with lots of different frequencies, but then the frequencies it actually uses are all related and repeated. 
So you get repeated notes, repeated motifs, repeated melodic structures. And this repetition moves your brain from calculating stuff across all of space and time to calculating across a matter of minutes, seconds and milliseconds. So it's really closing in the degree of calculation it's engaged in. And in the next video, I'll go into why in psychedelic states we actually see sound, particularly music and particularly speech. But for now, my closing observation is clamping and funneling is everywhere. It's our cultural fabric. It's the nature given language with which other organisms speak to us using physics. Thanks a lot for watching. Please subscribe if you want to watch upcoming videos and I'll see you next time.